All right, good morning. Um, sorry if my mic starts yelling at you. I may or may not have had tiny fingers grabbing it during worship. Um, well, like you said, my name is Chase, and I'm the youth pastor here at Lakes, and I have the great honor and privilege of bringing you the word of the Lord this morning. Um, so before we go any further, why don't we bow our heads in some prayer? So Father God, we want to say thank you for today. Jesus, thank you for this opportunity for us to gather here together. Thank you for this opportunity for us to worship you together in spirit and in truth. Lord, we ask that you'd be with us. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to just fill us and indwell us today. And God, as Josh said, give us soft hearts that we are willing to hear what you have to say to us this morning. And God, when I preach your word this morning, please give me your words and nothing but your words, Lord, so that I would speak your truth and nothing more and nothing less. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Caitlin, do you actually mind tossing me my water bottle? Actually, you're fine. You're fine. One second. Don't worry about it. Okay. Um, there's a reason why it's okay, because I'm actually going to be sitting down here in a second, because we're going to be watching a video. Uh, it's going to be about two minutes and 30 seconds, but this video is actually... Oh, thank you very much, Kyle. This video is actually um, a video taken from our uh, missions trip that we just took as a youth group. Uh, last weekend, we went over to Whitefish, Montana, and it was actually it was a, a service trip. So what we do is, is we go over Thursday, we drive Thursday over to Whitefish, Montana. It takes us about five and a half, six hours when it should take you four and a half hours. Uh, it's what happens when you have 13 little bladders. But um, we go over there, and then on Friday, we will serve that church for about an eight-hour workday is what we ended up doing this year. And so some of the things that they did is, is they cleared out a fire pit area of all its weeds, they leveled it with shovels, and then they came in and brought in about three inches of gravel to put in it and like an eight, eight-foot radius around the whole thing. Um, they sanded and stained three picnic benches. They weed-whacked a lot, and I, and I mean a lot of weeds. See, we had two students who weed-whacked for seven hours straight. And so when they were weed-whacking the whole time because they have a, a Frisbee golf course at that church, and they had like three or four holes that were just overgrown with weeds that they didn't have time to take care of. And so we had two students, Mia and, and uh, Lily, they were just weed whacking the entire time. And when they ran out of fuel or they ran out of line, they came to me. And that was the only break that they really got except for lunch was when I would have to fill it up with fuel or, or replace the line. And I actually talked to one of them uh, last Wednesday. I was like, how are your arms feeling? She's like, they still feel like they're vibrating. So, <laughs> which, I mean, seven hours of weed whacking, that's, that's what you're going to get. Uh, so they did that. Um, they, they cleared some debris, debris from a storm because they, you know, you guys had the hail storm and then we got a massive lightning and rainstorm that night, um, I think, or the day after you guys had the hail storm. And so there was a bunch of debris that needed to be cleared out. And so I strapped on a little uh, leaf blower, a, a gas leaf blower that was bigger than the little girl who was uh, operating it, um, which that was pretty fun to watch. I would try to start it and I would almost pull her over. Um, and then they moved about two cords of wood uh, which was actually wood that we chopped two years ago and left deep in the woods. And so we had to back up a trailer deep in the woods, load up that trailer, then shift it so that way they could have wood ready and functional for the fireplace that we just leveled out for them. Uh, and then there was a lot of like trashed wood frames that were deep in the woods for whatever reason, and we had to move those over to a burn pile. So, and I'm sure that there might have been a couple other things that I forgot to say, but, but these kids worked hard. And I am extremely proud of them. And as a church, we should be proud of the young people that we have attending here. Because to get 13, 12, or 13-year-olds to work for eight hours straight and, and not really have a whole lot of issues, like, man, that's impressive. And so I was really impressed with the work that they did today, or last week. And, uh, and one of the things that, that I was really happy about with this whole service trip is that these students got to learn that the church is bigger than this church right here. They got to learn that the kingdom of God extend, extends into a lot of different areas. And so they got to serve the big C community church, right? They got to serve the kingdom of God, and they got to learn what that meant. Um, so before I get any further and start spoiling some stuff, we have a video for you guys to watch. And so we will watch that together.
<clears throat> so you may have noticed there weren't a whole lot of photos of us doing work on a work trip. Um, I promise we did some work. Uh, but the problem was is when we got to working, I got to the end of the day and I was like, oh, I forgot to take photos and videos. And all my leaders were like, oh, yeah, us too. Um, so we just forgot to take photos because we were too busy working. And I guess you'll just have to trust me on that. If you really want to follow up on it, you can call that church and see if we actually did work. Um, but one of the things that, that I didn't plan on talking about but I do want to talk about just because it was just such an amazing thing that God did for us on that trip is when we actually got to that church, they have, I don't know, Glenn, if he's here, if it was like a quarter mile driveway or something, it's a pretty long driveway. And uh, when we parked the truck or the, the bus, I put it in reverse to get the trailer in a better position and it died. I was like, what the heck just happened? So without thinking, I just started it back up and I moved it. Um, and then I drove it around a little bit more. And then we came back to find that there were pools of transmission fluid on the ground where the bus had been parked. And then we looked up that really long road, and we saw just this trail of transmission fluid as we were coming down the transmission oil. And so um, we were like, what the heck is going on? And so Glenn actually spent the majority of our work day trying to figure out what was going on. And by the grace of God, the bus worked, and we were able to get it back here on time. So that was just a little miracle that God worked for us there. Um, so he wasn't, he, he's got a good excuse as to why he didn't take photos. I don't have the same excuse, uh, because I was there doing it. But... Um, as you saw, the next day after we did our, our service trip, we had the opportunity to join the youth group there for some baptisms down at the city beach. And uh, it was absolutely amazing because during that baptism, which was this 18-year-old girl whose family isn't in the faith, and they told her that she needed to wait until she was an adult to get baptized, and she honored her parents and did that. But in hearing her story, I had three students, which you saw get baptized, come up to me and say, hey, we want to get baptized. And so I was like, oh my gosh, are you sure? And they're like, yeah. I was like, really, are, are you sure? They're like, yeah, we're sure. I'm like, okay, do you understand that what you're doing is, is you're making a public commitment to live for Jesus for the rest of your life and you're proclaiming him to be your master and savior and that you've accepted him into your heart. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's what we're doing. I'm like, okay, are you sure that you want to get baptized though? They're like, yeah, why are you asking so many times? I, I don't, they didn't say that, but I'm sure that they could be thinking that. And the reason why I want to do that is because I didn't want them to get baptized out of an emotional hype. Of, of wanting, oh, other people are being committed, so I want to be committed to. I wanted it to be a genuine commitment of faith. So I asked them an annoying amount of times if they really wanted to be baptized, and they remain steadfast in that, and if they knew what they were doing. So they asked Glenn and Hannah and me uh, to baptize them because those were leaders that had um, really done some, some good work in their life. And uh, as we had the great honor and privilege of, of baptizing them, I found out two of them accepted Jesus that very day and wanted to get baptized for him. So yeah, let's, let's celebrate that. As a, as a church, we should really be celebrating that. And then the third one, she actually got saved at Spring Retreat but didn't tell us. Hey, okay, it's back. Okay, and, and didn't tell us. And, and so she's actually just been, I guess, like an undercover Christian for these past few months. Um, but then she just got baptized with us as well. So that was, that was really cool. And you actually saw all three of them sitting next to each other on the bus, and two of them had a thumbs up, and the other one was sleeping up against the window. Those were the three girls that got baptized. Um, so, yeah, we can, uh, we can just extend uh, a warm welcome to them and to the kingdom of God. It's, it's amazing. So it was a truly amazing experience, and I, I thank God for the opportunity to do that, and I thank God for the co-laborers that I have with me in the youth group. Um, and I'll say that with, without that faithful service to those youth students, I don't believe that these students would have had an opportunity to come to know Jesus. At least, maybe not yet. You know, because who can say when their next opportunity would be there if these youth leaders hadn't been there for them, right? And I believe that this is true for the students who found God at Spring Retreat. Um, we had multiple students who came to Christ at Spring Retreat as well. And I believe that it's without the leaders who are serving faithfully in the youth group those students wouldn't have the opportunity to have found Christ. Or, or even for the students who already know Christ, who've grown up in the church, like Lincoln. I'm going to be calling out a lot of names today. Lincoln will be the first one, right? Without the people serving faithfully there, these students wouldn't have the opportunity to know God or grow in their faith in God, right? That's reality. Okay. So, without Glenn's, Caitlin's, Hannah's, Emma's, Jordans, and now Joe and Jamie who are stepping into the youth program, and they actually helped us at Spring Retreat. Um, without these people serving faithfully, and I'll even put myself in there, without us serving faithfully, these students wouldn't have the opportunity to know Jesus. 
they wouldn't have the opportunity to connect with the certain leaders, which is why two of the students were like, wow, Hannah has really spoken life into me. I want Hannah to be one of the ones to baptize me. And one of them was like, Glenn's my favorite person in the world. I'm like, yeah, me too. And so she wanted Glenn to come and baptize her. And I got to be there just because I was the pastor. But, but these were leaders that have spoken life in these students' lives. Because of their service, these kids came to Christ and, and they got to see the fruit of their labor in baptizing those students with me. See, without these people faithfully serving, these students wouldn't have an opportunity to know God like they do. And I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back and say, oh my gosh, I'm doing such a good job. That's not what I'm trying to do. And, and I'm not trying to do this to exalt these leaders in front of the entire congregation and say, wow, look at them. They're so holy and righteous and amazing. I mean, they are, but that's not why I'm doing it. What I'm doing is because I, I want to, to share this with the congregation as an example, because I believe that these leaders are stepping up and, and serving God in the way that God has called them to, and they're doing it faithfully, and they're doing it with excellence. And so I want them to be examples. And I'm pretty sure that all of them are partially mortified that I'm calling them out by name. And, and I mean, if you turn and look at them, which you probably shouldn't because I'll make them very nervous, but if you, if, if you saw, they'll probably be mortified that I'm calling them out by name right now. Some of them will probably be beat red in the face. Right? Because, it, because it's an awkward thing. Because they don't do it for the attention. They do it because they love their God and they love these students. That's why they do it. And so I'm extremely thankful for them that they're doing what Christ has taught them to do. And, and, and I'm thankful for everybody that serves at this church, whether it's the worship team who's up here all the time. They, they have practice on Thursday night. So, so not only are they here on Sunday mornings way early, but they're, they're practicing on Thursday night. So they're giving up two days of their week to come in and serve the church. I'm, I'm thankful for the people who do, who do coffee and, and make sure that we have coffee there. I'm thankful for the people who are greeting and ushering and doing the live stream and, and media. I'm thankful for everybody who's serving here or serving in the kids' ministry. I'm thankful because without your service, the kingdom of God would be far worse off. Can I get an amen to that? So, today, you might have been able to guess it, we're discussing service. Not like Sunday service, but like serving service. And how in serving people, we also get to serve God. And I believe that that's a beautiful spiritual truth that I've, I've come to a deeper understanding this week. So, let's read together in Luke chapter 22, verses 24 through 27. This is what it says. Now there was also a dispute among them, the disciples, as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. Let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. What a powerful statement from the creator of the universe. This word serve, actually, I'm going to try to pronounce it. I spent actually way too much time trying to learn how to pronounce this Greek word. And it's, it's deakoneo. It means to serve. And, it, and it's, it's actually the word that we get deacon from, which are just like head servants within the church. So like Jessica Hamp, she leads the coffee. She would be the, the deacon of coffee, right? <laughs> Amen for the deacon of coffee, Right? And, and so, you know, we have, we have Scott Gardner, who's, who's over the sound and media. So he'd be the deacon of, of sound and media, right? This is the idea of service that we get. This is the same word that we get the word deacon from. But this, this word, is, it's actually distinct from being like a slave or, or a, a servant like that. But it, it, it's a different word for serve. And it carries the basic nuance of personal service. Personal service. Not enslavement but personal service. And that's a big deal. But when you look at this text that we just read, what might strike you as odd? Um, Perhaps it's the fact that the most powerful and holy being that has, will, or ever will exist, has, does, or will ever exist, maybe it's the fact that the most powerful being exalts service as being such a high virtue. That's kind of odd. 
And, and in fact, it's, it's not just such a high moral virtue that he establishes, but it's, but it's so important to him that he himself comes to this earth not to be served, but to what? Serve. You might have to be a little bit louder for me today. I'm used to the youth group where they'll just start shouting at me and we, we start talking back and forth. So. But I have to tell you guys that every time I preach. It's okay, we'll, we'll get there. We'll be there together. But he comes as one who serves. But maybe it's not the fact that the creator of the universe thinks about service as being so important, but maybe it's the type of service that's being rendered. See, see, Jesus, the type of service that he talks about, do you guys know what type of service he talks about? We actually saw it in the text. What was he talking about? There was somebody sitting at a table and somebody serving it. Jesus is talking about waiting tables. So here we are, we're at, the, at where God actually established his communion. This is, this is you know, where Jesus is hang, hanging out with his disciples for one of the last times. And they're thinking that Jesus is going to come in as this warrior king and take the kingdom back. And they say, man, who's going to be the greatest among us? Who's going to be the one to rule next to Christ? Who's going to be the best among us? Who's going to have the most riches, the most prestige, and the most power? And Jesus says, why are you talking about prestige and power? You should be talking about waiting tables. I mean, what a a Jesus-like response to a statement. I mean, every time we see the disciples, they're, they're talking about something, and Jesus just gives this weird left hook that they don't see coming. They're talking about being great in the kingdom of God in this like military sense and ruling sense and, and, and having power, and he says, you should be thinking about waiting on tables. Maybe that's the weird part, is that Jesus is literally talking to us about waiting Tables. And, 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 and not just talking about waiting tables, but he elevates waiting tables to be a virtuous act. And so virtuous that he himself came essentially to wait tables. The creator of the universe likens his service to waiting tables. That's pretty odd to me. And, and I think one of the really neat things about this is he asks the question, Who's the greater person in this scenario? The person sitting down at the table or the person waiting on the table? And what does Jesus say about that? He doesn't say he who serves is actually greater because he's more like me. And likewise, he doesn't say the one who's sitting down should get up and serve too. No. What does he say? He says, I come to you as one who serves. So he doesn't correct this understanding of of the person sitting down as being the one that's greater he, he actually uses that understanding to deepen our knowledge of who he is. Which is baffling. Deacaneo, what a baffling reality about God. What a confounding truth about the creator of the entire universe is that he comes as one who serves tables. Now, what does it mean to wait on a table? Um... You know, this, this actually strikes a chord with me, and some of you may know why, and that's because I served in the restaurant for seven years, and I was a waiter for about four or five of those years, and so I've done a lot of time serving people at a table and, and meeting their needs, and um, I actually served at Red Robin at the Spokane Valley Mall. Uh, that's, that's one of my first job at a out of high school, and that's the job that I worked all throughout college, and that was my motivation to keep going to college. Uh, it was, but, it, but it was a good job. Um, I, I actually learned a lot. I actually, I, I don't know why I'm saying this, but I, I like, couldn't walk up and interrupt people in conversations. Um, that's where I started, and so I'd walk up to a table and people would be talking, and I would just stand there for like a minute or two before they stopped talking and realize that I was there. Super awkward, but, but I learned a lot, and now I'll just go up and interrupt anybody's conversation for good or bad. But do you know what the difference is between a good server and a bad server? What's the key difference? They serve, okay? <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that is a key difference between a good server and a bad server, is one who actually serves. Um, I would phrase it like this after my years in the restaurant industry. I would say it's, it's the ones who care do a good job. Because all the servers at the restaurant were capable of serving. That's why they were servers. They're capable of doing the job. But whether they did their job well or not was dependent on how much they cared. And now, whether they cared for the customer personally, like our word deaconeo means, or if they cared more about themselves and doing a good job, I I can't really say. But the servers who cared, they did an excellent job. Now, 
Why is that? Well, see, if you don't care about the people sitting at your table, you don't care if, at least in Red Robin, because we do frills, it's fry refills. So we, I haven't worked there for years, and I still say we. They do fry refills. Like we call them frills, right? If, if you don't care, then you don't care that the people are out of fries. If you don't care about those people, then you don't care that they ran out of their drinks. If you don't care, then you don't care that their burger didn't come out how they wanted it. You just don't care. See, it's the servers that didn't care that I would see them in the back texting or, or eating their own food while their food was up in the window getting cold or the people were, were waiting for the refills and hadn't seen their server for 10 minutes. And of course, there are times where, where servers would be, just be struggling and drowning and having a difficult time. But there was a lot of times where servers were just wasting time because they didn't care about their tables. And did those people get good service? No. Now, what about the servers who did care? They cared that the people's drinks were, were halfway down and, and then they would ring in a new one and bring out a drink when their, their drink was halfway empty. Or if they were like, oh, wow, that table's already eaten like half of their fries and their t- plate's been there for six seconds. I'm going to get some more fries coming out to the table. Oh, they just, you know, dump some sauce on the ground. I'll get more sauce coming out there. But, but how are they able to know that that's all happening? They're paying attention because they care. The only reason that they're able to do that is because they care. And uh, I know that when I was serving at my best and at my peak, uh, it was typically when I had friends or family sitting at my table. I would have friends walk in, and, and there were some guys from the, the young adults group that, that used to come in Red Robin, and I would, I would send fries to their table before I even got to see them. Or if my mom walked in, I knew that she wanted a sugar-free peach iced tea with lemon and a straw with extra ice. Right? She wanted that, and I would get that to the table. I knew that, that my nephew, his favorite thing was the royal burger without tomato. So I would just have that going. Because I cared. And I cared a lot more, whether that reflects good or not on me, I cared a lot more about my friends and my family than I did the strangers in my section. And so when my friends and family would sit down, I, I would prioritize them over the other people in my sections most of the time, unless my parents were like, hey, we, you, you're fine, go and you know, go serve the other tables. You'll still get a good tip from us, it doesn't matter. But I deeply cared. And so I was able to serve them because I was watching. I was paying attention. I knew what their personal needs were, and I knew what their personal preferences were because I knew them and I cared about them, right? So and if you know somebody, and if you have somebody, and I was actually talking to Caitlin about this. I just remembered there was this family that would come in, and this guy would drink like seven root beer floats in the, in the time that he was there with us because we had bottomless root beer floats. It was like five ninety nine back then, and, and it's probably like $16 now. But... It's five ninety nine for for root beer float, so I would get a root beer float and then a refill out to him before I could even get to the table as well. Why? Because I knew him, and I cared. I knew him and I cared. That's why I would do that. If I don't know him, can I know that he's going to have seven root beer floats? No. And if I don't care about him having a good experience, is he going to get seven root beer floats? No. See, the the best servers that were there were people that would get to know their tables whether they're regulars or just get to know their tables while they're there. Are they, are they paying attention? Are they demonstrating that they truly care? So when Jesus talks about coming as one who serves in light of serving tables, that struck a chord with me because I'd done it for so long. And for whatever reason, I had never read this as being waiting tables. In all my years as a Christian, this last week when I was reading with this, this was the new thing that popped up to me. I'm like, wait, Jesus, there's a guy sitting down at a table, someone's serving this. Jesus is talking about waiting on tables. This is amazing. That was some new knowledge for me. But what is Jesus trying to say when he's talking about service and waiting on tables? And he says that I've come to serve you like this. Jesus is saying that he's watching, that he's paying attention, that he knows you. That he's come to know you. He says, I'm watching you in the best way possible. I care about who you are and I've come to serve you where you're at. That's what he's saying. Jesus says that he cares. See, he didn't just come to check the box of serving, like, oh, the Father's told me to come and serve. I guess I'll come and serve. And it's, it's not like, I mean, it would have been good enough, right, if Jesus came down to serve humanity as a whole and die for us and not know the individual, right, because then he still grants us salvation. That would have been good enough, right? And we would still be thankful for a God who saves us even if he doesn't know us personally, right? 
That would have been enough. But no, Jesus takes it one step further as he always does. And he makes it personal service to the individual. What a confounding truth about God and a baffling reality about who Jesus is. It comes to serve personally. He came to care for us deeply and serve us where we're at. See, the way that Christ serves his people and his God is in a personal fashion. And the best servers I ever worked with made their service personal. Because true and meaningful service is service to a person, not an organization, and not a cause. True service is service to a person, and Jesus demonstrates that. So if you're serving at this church, I hope you're not serving for the building or even for the leadership. I hope you're serving for the people in it. And I'd even go as far to say that if we lose the personal touch and service, I think that we lose true and meaningful service. Can I get an amen to that? So as I served, I also saw another principle at work. And sorry, I'm not trying to talk about myself so much, but this is just, I have a lot of life experience and like I don't fish, so I don't have fishing stories. This is the one thing I have stories in, so I got to milk it. So as I served, I see another principle at work, that when I'm serving a table, I'm serving two people or two things simultaneously. And actually, Pastor Scott helped me to come to this realization, right? When, When I'm serving the table, I'm serving the people there at the table, but I'm also serving the restaurant, am I not? From providing a service to both. The restaurant gets its money, the people get their experience and their food, and hopefully without tomato. And I, I'll just say, I don't know why, but people freak out about tomatoes on burgers. That's the one thing I've been yelled at more as a server was that there's tomatoes there. I'm like, you can just pick them off. Okay, done. So I'm providing a service for both of them. I'm serving both the restaurant and I'm serving the people there. So simultaneously, in one act, I'm providing service to two people. Likewise, when we humble ourselves and we serve like Christ served, we're serving two different people at the same time. When we went on the service trip and the youth leaders were serving the students, whether they're making them a meal or or helping them with with any meds that they might have to take or, or helping them with a job that they were doing, when they were serving that student out of love for them, who else were they serving? Jesus can say it louder. They were serving God at the very same time. And why is that? Because they were serving God's children. And you know, in the youth group, I, I also wasn't planning on serving this, saying this, but it'll happen. We've had parents come up and, and say, especially to Caitlin, this just happened recently. That she said, thank you so much for everything that you've done for my little girl. Right? So, so if parents, and, and for those of you who are parents, when somebody does something nice for your child, that feels like a service to you, Correct? So how much more our creator in heaven feels blessed and loved than when we are serving his children genuinely and with love, right? So when we're serving our brothers and sisters in Christ, when we are serving people personally, a diakoneo service, we're serving our creator and our God. So we see that we have service to God in serving his people, and that's why I titled my sermon Service in serving. And again, and I can't think of a better type of service than the service trip that we just took, where the youth leaders were working shoulder to shoulder with the students, helping them, encouraging them, sometimes being stern with them because they're sitting in the shade talking for too long. But they served these kids. And they constantly give of themselves. See, they they not only show up consistently week in and week out, but they're also willing to be locked in a bus or a building for a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday with 13, 12-year-olds. That's not service. I don't know what is. And they do that, and I'm going to use my leaders as examples again. They do that because they love these students and they love their God and they're serving these kids personally. Do you think that it's coincidence that Olivia wanted Glenn to baptize her? Do you think that it's, it's coincidence that Marley wanted Hannah to baptize her? Do you think that's coincidence? No. Or do you think that it's coincidence that Cadence wanted Hannah to baptize her? No, it's because they served those students faithfully and personally. See, they, they know those students just as Jesus knew his disciples. 
They're serving those kids just as God serves us. And they're not perfect at it, but they're excellent. And it's an example that we should follow. Like I said, I'm very thankful for my co-laborers in Christ, but they do it because of their great love for the students, and I see that love week in and week out. But see, when they're doing that, they're not just serving the students, right? There's that beautiful truth that they're serving God at the exact same time because they are serving God's children. All right, open up your Bibles to John 13, 12. I'm going to read 12 through 17 really quick together. There you go. We have this thing in the youth group. When you get there first, you say amen, and then everybody says amen. And um, it's, it's an awesome thing. It's an encouraging thing to help people, you know, get in, in you know, hyped up about reading the Bible because it's a beautiful thing. Amen. Perfect. Okay. I'll say amen too. All right. <clears throat> Chapter 13, verse 12. And this is also actually at the Last Supper, which we just read about as well in, in Luke 22. So when he had washed their feet taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for I am so. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who was sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Back in that culture, when you have dirt roads, I don't know if you've ever, someone's ever talked to you about this, you have dirt roads and sandals, your feet get pretty nasty. Especially because you don't have a Kia to drive somewhere in. You're walking everywhere. So from what I've been taught, it was the lowest servant was the one, or like that, that new servant, you know, got to work your way up the ranks, the busboy of the servants, if you will. He had to wash the feet, or, or she had to wash the feet, because it was something that nobody wanted to do, because it's gross. Amen. <laughs> but what does Jesus do? He makes himself as the most humble of servants, serving these people personally and honoring them, because when you had a guest in your house, you would honor them and wash their feet and, and offer them a meal, which is why there's actually a time when Jesus um, basically yells at, at a at a at a Pharisee for not offering him food or to wash his feet. See, he honored his people personally. He served. And then what does he do? He commands us to do the exact same thing. And if you go on into 34 and 35 of John 13, you'll see Christ say, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And God has commanded us to serve one another. See, I think service and genuine love go hand in glove. If you love somebody, you're going to serve them. Amen? I mean, we don't see that in any greater way than our own children. I mean, who wants to give up sleep in, in their free time to, to serve somebody that just cries all the time? Like, but we see that service and that love. Because we love them, and, and so we serve them. Jesus also said that if you love him, you'd obey his commandments to serve one another. And so are we not demonstrating our love for God when we serve his people? And so it's no longer odd to me that God would use the idea of waiting a table as talking about true service. That's not an odd thing anymore. And see, it doesn't even seem odd to me anymore that God would, would elevate service to high, such a high virtue. It seems right and proper and good. It seems like the type of thing only God would do because if any one of us was in his position, we would come to be served and not to serve it is so good and proper that God would elevate service to high, to such a high virtue because it is such a palpable experience of love. That's what service truly is. So church, you don't have to be a part of the youth group because I've been talking about my youth staff this whole time. You don't have to be part of the youth group to have true and meaningful service. You can serve with purpose and rich meaning in many, many different ways. We have the children's ministry. We have hospitality. We have greeting. We have administration. We have missions. We have the worship team. Right? We have sound. We have media. We have the live stream. And we even have driving on Sunday mornings to pick up donuts for everybody. Right? There's, 
And how many have been blessed by that one too? There are so many ways that you can serve. And I would encourage you to serve. See, I love this church and I love you guys. And this church has always been a church that's had a very high percentage of volunteers in it. But currently we do have some holes in our volunteer positions. I know that that the kids ministry does need a lot more help. And in fact, she's been struggling to get help all summer. So church, please, for the love of your God and for the love of his people and your brothers in Christ, your sisters in Christ, serve. Now, if this feels like a guilt trip, I really don't want it to be. But I do want this to be a call to action. Because if we love God, we will serve his people. Amen? Amen. And now, I don't want you to say, oh, wow, that pastor guy, he just wants us to go and give him free labor. I do, but that's not all I want. Okay? I, I want you to be serving your God because he tells you to. I want you to be obeying your God because he's your master and he's your Lord. Just like those three girls who said, yes, Jesus is my master. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. That's the response that we should be having to God and saying, God, yes, I will do what you've commanded me to do. I will serve your people. And, so, and that doesn't necessarily have to happen here on a Sunday morning. That should actually be happening all throughout the week. We should be in community with people and we should be serving one another and loving one another as if the other one is better than our own selves. Right? Who's greater, the one sitting at the table or the one serving who Jesus said, I come to you as one who serves. Is that not an admission that the person sitting at the table is greater? Is that not Jesus saying that he accepts that and that he's going to take that, that humble position? Is he then not telling us to do that ourselves? See, because church, I don't, I don't know about you, but our God is a great king. Right, And we see that in, in Malachi 1. He is a great and mighty king, and he came to serve. And so if our great and mighty king is serving, who are we to do any different? Now, I'm not just saying you have to serve here. Serve everywhere, elsewhere. And if this does feel like a guilt trip to you, then please go elsewhere and serve elsewhere. But serve because your God commands you to serve. Not because some preacher told you to on a Sunday morning. Serve because your God tells you to do it. And church, I don't think that we can understand how our service will truly affect the kingdom of God. How will our actions today ring out in eternity? I don't know. But I do know that three more souls, if they continue in the faith, will live with Jesus for eternity because of the actions of my youth staff. And how does that change the lives of their children later on? What effect has the service of Hannah, Glenn, Emma, Caitlin, Jordan and Joe and Jamie, what, what effect will that have in eternity? I don't know. Likewise, when you come on a Sunday morning, why do people stay here? It's really hard to say. Why do people come to know Jesus? Is it partly because of the smiling face that opens the door and says good morning because that's one of the first people that's actually shown them kindness in the past month? Is it that it's, it's hard enough for them to actually walk into the front door, let alone shove past people to find a seat for themselves so they, they have somebody who helps them find you a seat? Is it, is it because that they you know, were up all night and couldn't sleep and so now it's because of our deacon of coffee that they're able to stay awake? What, what is it that enables people to really see the Lord? And how will our service affect that? I don't think we'll ever truly know until we get to heaven what our actions, how our actions will affect the kingdom of God. Just like I did not expect three kids to get saved on a trip where there was a lot of manual labor. But it happened. I had no expectations of three young girls coming to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior after I gave them power tools and made them carry a bunch of wood. There was no expectation of that happening, but Jesus did his work, and I had no idea, but but it happened. Likewise, you will have no idea what your service will actually do in the kingdom of God. And maybe we won't know, like I said, until we see Jesus in heaven, but it will have an effect and your service to God will ring out in eternity if you so do it genuinely and you humble yourself like Christ and serve like Christ. Can I get an amen to that? So church, please be like Christ and serve somehow, somewhere, in whatever capacity you are able to do so. Serve how you are able to serve. Don't compare yourself to other Christians and say, oh, that person's serving in a way that I could never do it, so I'm not good enough. Don't do that. You serve how you're able to serve because God made you who you are and gave you gifts to serve how you could serve. So don't do a comparison because that's, I believe that's of the enemy is when we start comparing ourselves. Be who God has created you to be and serve how you are able to serve. So if you want to get it plugged in here, you can contact the office. You can go to our website. We have a form that you can fill out. Or um, if you don't 
like me guilt tripping you, which I wasn't trying to do, again, go somewhere else and serve. But church, serve. For the love of God, serve. All right, let's pray. Well, Lord God, thank you so much for today. Thank you for this opportunity. And Lord, thank you for your word. Jesus, we love you so much. And I just thank you for the opportunities that you give us to serve, that you love us enough that you'd come and serve us and that you'd love everyone else enough that you'd tell us to serve your children. God, thank you for being a personal God. Thank you for being a God that knows us personally and loves us personally. Amen. So before you go, we have an elder who's going to come up and, and give you a word, and, and uh, then he'll be the one to dismiss you.